Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. Super excited. I'm here at our LA studio hanging out, and we've got some incredible stuff coming your way uh, in the next few weeks with the Model Health Show. But today we're going to kick it off with one of the strongest humans to ever walk the face of the earth. All right. This guy has literally set records. He squatted over a thousand pounds. What? That's like squatting a, a baby elephant or something. That's just crazy, crazy, crazy strong. And he was inspired as I was from childhood, you know, and just seeing our superheroes on the big screen. And this is also getting into important conversation about like to what extremes do we go in order to kind of live up to those standards and to be those superheroes we see on the screen? And what are they actually doing in order to achieve those goals? You know, we don't want to overlook the fact of obviously hard work, dedication and training and eating and sleeping and all those things come into play. But there's also this realm where we get into supplements and, and drugs and those kind of things. And it's really surprising to me um, when folks don't realize just how many people in our culture today are on pharmaceutical medications. I remember when I was uh, running my, my practice, my nutrition practice, and I had patients coming in and one of my patients... He was just in his 30s, and I think I might have been about 30 at the time. And he was shocked when he heard that I wasn't on any pharmaceutical medications. He just couldn't believe it. He was like, you're not on one? Not one? It's because in his world, in his domain, in his family, it's just something that you naturally transition into. you know. And, so, and also on the Model Health Show, I want to bring in different perspectives. You know, I don't want to just bring on everybody that 100% fits in my lane or my approach or uh, the things that I believe to be most effective, but to bring in some some different voices as well. And so, but I also want you to be able to make intelligent decisions and be, become equipped with those things that really sing to your own heart and your spirit and your own goals. And so uh, if we're talking about getting stronger, uh, there's nobody better to learn from today. And so we've got uh, him coming up in just a couple of minutes, but listen, I've been on the road for a while. I've got some adventures to share with you guys you're not going to believe, all right? A lot has been coming at me the last few days. And just taking the opportunity when I travel, it's I have my little Door of the Explorer backpack that I travel with, and I've got a few of my favorite things in there. You know, I've got a couple of books in there, got my headphones, over-the-ear headphones in there as well, but I've also got uh, my Onnit supplements as well, specifically the Shroom Tech Sport, because I'm when I, whenever I travel, I've what's so crazy, I've worked out at gyms all over the world, all right? I straight worked out at a gym. It's just crazy to even say this in the Philippines, right? But when I'm on the road, I know that I'm gonna exercise. And recently when I spoke at an event in Jamaica, when I was checking in and I asked the front desk attendant where, where the gym is at, he was like, what? You're gonna work out on vacation? And I was like, why wouldn't I, you know? It's just, it's a part of, of what I do and it's something that I enjoy doing. And so, but of course, you know, when you're, when you're out on the road and you got a lot of stuff going on, having that little bit of a boost or a little bit of support is always of an advantage in my opinion. But for me, I'm looking for things that are from earth grown nutrients that are not synthetic and that also have time tested value and safety and efficacy as well. So that's my approach. And so for me, that's why I love on it so much because they're utilizing supplements from earth grown nutrients. And their Shroom Tech Sport is derived from cordyceps, which cordyceps has been, we have literally over 2000 years of documented use of cordyceps in uh, being supportive of everything from uh, managing blood sugar to even libido. Okay, I can't just say it regularly, it's libido. Uh, so that's another aspect uh, as well. But here's what it has as far as training. Now, this is a double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. This is the gold standard of clinical studies to see, does this actually work? And so this study found that uh, when folks were taking the Shroom Tech Sport, specifically Shroom Tech Sport, this isn't just any random cordyceps product, but Shroom Tech Sport, here's what happened. In taking, and this was a 12-week clinical trial, Shroom Tech Sport pre-workout, their bench press reps increased by 12% versus the control group who didn't have Shroom Tech Sport. Increased their bench press and back squat reps by 7%. All right, so if you're doing the supersets. And also shown to increase their cardiovascular performance, their endurance by 
so it works. And here's the, the best part about it, no crazy side effects, no weird stimulant kind of jitters or anything like that that you might get from typical pre-workout supplements. And again, it's from Earth Grow Nutrients. So I highly recommend it. It's one of my favorite things. Uh, it's onit.com forward slash model, and you get 10% off. The Shroom Tech Sport and everything else that they carry, whether you want to get yourself some fitness equipment, they've got the battle ropes, they've got, they, they're the ones who really put steel clubs and maces into popular culture. And so they've got all that stuff. You get 10% off that as well. Uh, so pop over there, check them out. On it, that's O N N I T dot com forward slash model, 10% off everything they carry, including Shroom Tech Sport. So definitely, definitely pop over there, check it out. And on that note, let's get to the Apple Podcast Review of the Week. Another five-star review titled True Inspiration for Optimal Health by 27TKJ27. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, the knowledge and passion you have given me this year. I started listening to the Model Health Show at the beginning of this year and have been grateful ever since. In fact, it was my surprise when I looked over the keynote presenters at the sixth annual Biohacking Conference this year and noticed you were speaking. I made sure to tell our friends at the conference that you were a person to learn from. My only regret was actually not meeting you at the conference. It was nice to know that you and your family was a true inspiration for anyone who did meet you there at the conference. I know I will meet you someday when I become a game changer. So don't be surprised when a six foot tall blonde man gives you a big hug of thanks for new knowledge that you've given to me. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'll look out for that hug. I appreciate it so, so very much. And what a cool event. What a cool experience. And uh, thank you for spreading the word and let other folks know about me as well. I appreciate you immensely. And, and thank you, everybody, for popping over to Apple Podcasts and leaving a review for the show and letting everybody know what you think about the show. And if you've yet to do so, guys, it's right on your phone. You can pause this, pop over, leave a review, and I'll appreciate it so very much. And it might just get featured as a review of the week here on the show. All right, so pop over there and leave a review. And on that note, let's get to our special guest and topic of the day. Today's guest is the incredible Mark Smelly Bell, all right? The smelly is in there, all right? Even when I first met him, that was th thrown into the, into the introduction, and you'll hear why, where he got the name Mark Smelly Bell from, but he's just a, a powerhouse in the field of, of uh, powerlifting and also in inspiration and a real leader and a pioneer in just uh, lifting techniques and utilizing specific pieces of equipment and he's one of the foremost experts on the planet in just finding ways to get stronger. And so I'm really excited to have him on the show. He's got a, a top-ranked podcast, and he's also been creating incredible videos and content on YouTube since way back in the day when YouTube first started. So he's just been in the field a long time, making a big impact on a lot of people. And I'd like to introduce you to the one and only Mark Smelly Bell. Awesome, Mark. So grateful to have you here, man. Yeah, thank, thank you. Appreciate out. it. Awesome, awesome. So you got this gym. It's in uh, in the Bay Area, right? We're in uh, Northern California, yeah, West yeah. Sacramento. Yeah, that's dope, man. So when did you have the... Well, first of all, let's just start at the beginning. What was the kind of initial drive and trigger for you to want to get into training and lifting heavy stuff? Like, where did that all come about? The beginning, man. We got to go way back. Got to go back 30 years. I, I'm 42. Started lifting around the age of 12, and uh, you know, luckily for me, there were some people around that that were into heavy training. You know, I got into training because of my brothers. But ultimately, we really sparked it, and what really got me in was a guy named Joe Garlop, who was a bully in school. Mm. He was friends with my he was friends with my brother, but like we weren't really cool with him, and he wasn't really like our families weren't cool with each other, yeah. and. Uh, like, I was not really uh, subject to bullying because I was a big kid, but he was like four or five years older than me. And so uh, I was just sitting there playing with my football, throwing it up in the air and catching it. And my my older brothers, uh, they were, you know, four or five years older than me, so they wanted nothing to do with me most of the time. So I was usually just hucking the ball to myself, you know. And uh, this guy's like, hey, Bell, he's like, throw me the ball. And I looked, and it's Joe Garlop, and I'm like, I shouldn't throw him the ball because I know he's kind of a jerk, yeah. you know? So I throw him the ball, and he just turns around and punts the damn thing in the woods. And I just, 
I couldn't find it. I went to look for it. I couldn't find it. So I just remember like I was already like lifting at the time, but yeah. you can kind of fast forward to, you know, a little Rocky montage of of me me getting in the gym and, and thinking about him the whole I'm gonna time. I'm going to punt him into the forest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I would just, it wasn't like this huge traumatic thing for me, but at the same time I was like, I don't really want to ever feel that way again. Like yeah. I want to be able to, if I needed to do something, then I want to be able to do something. And so I started taking the training a little bit more seriously. And uh, both of my older brothers played football. Yeah. And my brother Chris was, um, my brother Chris just, he was born with like bad knees and arthritis and all kinds so of pain and stuff. So the oldest or the middle brother? That's my middle brother. Yeah. Yeah. And so with him, the first guy that he went to, to like try to rehab some of these injuries and some of these things that he had, this pain, was a power lifter. The hmm. power lifting chiropractor who was like, hey, if you want to be healthy, if you want to not be in pain, then you're going to have to lift and you're going to have to make your body really strong. And we, as kids, we thought that was really cool. I was kind of following in his footsteps and I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know like bench squat and deadlift. I didn't know that we were powerlifting, but that's, that what, that's what was uh, coming across our desk at, at a really young age. My dad ended up buying uh, equipment for my brother. He ended up buying him like Olympic plates and all these different things. We had him in our basement. And uh, this is sort of where some of my, I think, early ideas of like business and lifting kind of the oh. association came together really quick because my dad worked for IBM. He lost his job with IBM and he started his own tax practice. And the tax practice was downstairs in our basement. That was half of the uh, gym was the tax practice. The other half was uh, where the weights were. And so I'd go downstairs. My dad would tell me about how much money he made because I was real fascinated as a kid by that. Yeah. And he would tell me how he did for the day, and then I'd go in and I'd like work out. So when I look back at it now, I'm like, oh, maybe that's where I got the idea to kind of like mix these things together. Dang, that literally was there, you know. Yeah, that's right powerful, there. man. And we were talking earlier about exposure, mm -hmm. you know. That's really, really cool. And so I got to get it straight from you. Like, where's the name? Even when you text me the first time, you were like, hey, it's Mark Smelly Bell. <laughs> yeah. Not Mark Bell, the Smelly. Where's the Smelly come from? Smelly comes from me smelling as a kid. I hated to take showers. I got two older brothers, and they were they were picking on me all the time. Yeah. You know, I was always I always wanted to play football or basketball, or I ran track. I did a bunch of different sports, and I was just there wasn't a lot of times uh, where I wasn't you know sweaty. And at that age too, you know, between ages of like twelve and like fifteen, I just didn't want to take a shower. They're like, you stink, you're smelly, you know? And, and then they realized it bothered me, it hurt my feelings. Mm -hmm. So then every time their friends came over, like, oh, it's smelly, you know, it's smelly. Oh, so wow. the name just, it's stuck smelly in stuck to me. But you grabbed it, because you know, <laughs> I met you, I was like, oh, he doesn't smell at all. <laughs> but why did you like keep that persona, you know, keep that with you all these years? I, you know, I like to have fun. Yeah, yeah. I like for things to be fun, you yeah. know. I, it keeps things exciting, you know. Even in our gym, um, you know, we get a little serious here and there with some squats and different heavy lifts that we do and stuff like that. But I still like to keep it fun. Even even from our uh, team that does our media and they, they film stuff for YouTube and stuff, they'll you know they'll film the lift and then they'll just you know turn the camera off. I'm like, no, get the guys. The other guy was pulling the guy's finger, or the other guy was doing this, and the other guy was, you know, making a funny face while the other guy was lifting. Like, let's capture that. Let's capture the guys laughing in between the sets and stuff because all this stuff hurts. You know, my gym yeah. is my gym is free, mm -hmm. and it's been free for many, many years. I've had the gym for twelve years. It's been free for probably about eight or nine years now, ever since I invented the slingshot product. And even with the gym being free, you would think, oh man. That's got to be, and the gym probably gets super overcrowded, but it doesn't because powerlifting is a really painful and a really thankless sport. It takes a long time to get good at it. Mm -hmm. It takes an even longer time to be great at it. And because it's, uh, it's just kind of a painful sport, um, you're not, it's not super attractive. And so I try to bring some fun to it. Yeah. So it's super training. Super right? training. That's the name. And uh, again, free gym, like I got to know what would inspire you to make your gym free because you would immediately, especially with the the level of of quality of equipment that you have there, the the quality of experience and insight that's able that's within those walls. Mm -hmm. What on earth would 
make you make the gym free? There's a lot of things that go into that. One thing I'm really obsessed with is to try to lower the barrier of entry into fitness, into strength training. One thing I've always found fascinating, and I, I don't even know if people even realize this, but me and you and everybody in this room can go work out and we could all do the exact same workout. It's pretty darn cool when you, when you think about it, especially if we were to do a powerlifting workout and we were to uh, do some uh, deadlifts and then we were to do some like lat pull downs and a couple other exercises that would help uh, maybe increase the deadlift, a couple back exercises, a couple grip exercises. Everybody in this room would be capable of doing it. It would just look different. Yeah. It would look a little different from person to person. The amount of weight that you move, the way that your body moves, the way that you handle it. One person might have a pre-existing injury or something, so you might have to modify something, but we can all go do it together. And what I love about fitness in general, and especially when it comes to lifting weights, is I have never met one person never met one person that does not possess the ability to get stronger. Mm. And it's my belief that I also have not seen anybody that doesn't possess the ability just to get better on a daily basis. And so rather than, you know, having the sport, you know, the sport be so hard and be so niche and like, you know, I have all this information, I'm going to hide it. I was just like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to make the gym free and let people... It's free. I'm going to tell people it's free. They're going to always think that I'm kidding, <laughs> especially because of my personality. It's free. It's actually free. 855 Riverside Parkway, West Sacramento, California, Tuesday, Thursday from 3 until five, or 6, from 3 till 6, and then Saturday, Sunday from uh, 9 or 10 to 1. It's free. It's wide open. So anybody listening right now can come in. Come awesome. check it out. It's actually awesome. free. You're going to have some people dropping in, <laughs> yeah. but also people should not expect that you're just going to you know, scoop scoop them under your wing yeah. like a mama bird and feed them. You know, I'm not like, always, yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not always there all the time, but yeah. but I will, you know, it, like, it just depends. I had somebody come in the other day and they were from Canada and they were, we have a store. When you first walk into the gym, you, you walk through a store and uh, we have all of our products there. We sell apparel and all kinds of stuff. And the guy, one of my guys came in and said, hey, you know, these guys are from Canada. They came in, they they stopped here special just to see you. I said, all right, and grabbed him, brought him in the gym with me, barely even said one word to him, said, you guys are hopping in on this workout. And they were like, huh? <laughs> and I had them exercising with us. And they went through a couple of sets and then took some pictures with them, and, and they kind of went on their way. But it just depends. Sometimes I do get to uh, put somebody under my wing. And if somebody, you know, when I, I, I used to be a, a strength coach for a high school football team for a while. Mm. And my one rule was I wasn't going to talk to you unless you were sweating. So there might be somebody coming into my gym for a while. Like they might, some, some of these guys and girls, they come up to me like, yeah, I've been training in here for like three or four weeks. And I'm thinking, oh, man, that's bad because I haven't even noticed them yet. Mm -hmm. But I don't notice you until I see you working really hard. And once mm -hmm. you're working really hard, that's probably when I'll come over and be like, hey, man, you know, you got to try to keep your back a little flatter on those deadlifts. Yeah. And this is how you're going to do this exercise. Yeah, that's what I was thinking you were going to say is, um, you know, making sure somebody's invested before you invest, right? <laughs> it just kind of is Captain Obvious. But, man, that's so awesome. And so, but the part of the reason that you're able to, to sustain such an incredible gym and, and atmosphere when you're not getting money coming in like, you know, other gyms might mm -hmm. is because you're an inventor as well. Yeah. And you just gave my oldest son, Jordan, the slingshot. That kid's uh, jacked, man. <laughs> All the listeners are gonna he, hear that. <laughs> can he beat you up yet? <laughs> oh, definitely not. Definitely not. That old man. That old he's, man. He's strength. laughing. <laughs> he doesn't know. You know the sneaky oh, stuff. Oh no, he knows. He knows the old man's strength, man. Um, but yeah, you know what's so crazy is when he said that. Oh yeah, he knew what it was—the slingshot mm -hmm. because they use it at his high school, right? That's so. That's cool. so powerful that you made something that is so integrated into the culture of lifting right now. So what was the inspiration for creating the slingshot? And what first of all, what is it for people who you know, don't know? It, it does it does feel good to hear stories like that, to hear that it's being used at high schools and to you know, there's a there's a a, a, a poster of the rock, you know, decked out in under armor gear and he's wearing our hip circle. That's a a piece that we have for uh, to kind of like warm up your hips and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And it's it's in like, you know, every uh, Dick's Sporting Goods around the country. It's pretty wild to see stuff like that happen. 
Uh, but it all started, you know, part of the reason, again, why the gym is free, too, is because I feel like I need to pay it back. You know, I need to pay this forward. Like, people taught me a lot of great things. I, I have great parents. I'm very fortunate. So if I'm able to you know, pass something along to somebody and they're able to get something out of it, then that's that's awesome. Then I'm, I'm all for it. <clears throat> but all this started, you know, um, just by working hard and by, by training hard and by maybe overdoing it here and there, uh, admittedly. Um, I was in this just, uh, I heard you mention before about how you were kind of neurotic about, you know, what, what you were drinking and what you were eating and trying to get your sleep in. And I got super neurotic with my strength and that, that I was in this, um, I, I tell people all the time, like, you don't want to kind of fall into the trap that I was in. It was, it wasn't, it wasn't the nicest place to be. Yeah. I, uh, I definitely took it too far and compromised my own health. Ended up with a lot of fortune that kind of came out of that. You know, I did break myself down. I tore my pec multiple times, torn tricep, torn bicep, torn hamstring. Tore up, you know, most of the stuff on my body that you can tear up. But the last time that I tore my, well, the second to last time I tore my pec, <laughs> tore my pec three times, even though you only have two pecs. But anyway. I, uh, <laughs> that inner pec. Yeah. Got yeah. that inner pec. Yeah, I tore an extra one. <clears throat> um when I tore my pec the second time, um, I was super frustrated. I was training for a competition. I was doing really well. Powerlifting is comprised of a bench, a uh, squat, and a deadlift. My squats and my deadlift were just on fire. They were going so well. And then I was in training, and I was bench pressing, and just something went in my chest. And I was like, man, I was like, what the hell was that? You know, and I, I racked the weight, and I wait a few minutes, and I'm like, oh, man, okay, that's this is bad, like I'm done, like something tore in here. And so I had to stop and shut it down for that day. A couple days went by, it started to bruise, and then it started to bruise all the way down my arm. My whole arm was, you know, black and blue, all the way to my chest, and then even down into my leg. I was like, how in the right. heck did this get down into my leg? But the gist of it is that's kind of the healing process. You know, the, the body's gonna start to heal, and the blood's gonna kinda kinda leak out from there and just it's it's kinda crazy looking. But that's what happened, and I was super frustrated and I was like, I don't want this to happen again. And I've I've run into so many people over the years that are telling me that they used to lift this amount of weight, they used to lift that amount of weight, and now I'm starting to understand why they say used to. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how do I get people to not say used to anymore? Maybe I can create something that would allow people to still handle some weight in a bench press, even you know after they have been hurt or just uh, after they have gotten a little older. And so I started playing around with a bunch of different ideas, and they were all really bad. <laughs> <laughs> they were they were poor ideas. I I uh, bought a really tight Under Armour shirt <clears throat> and tried to uh, uh, kind of put it up over my head and 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 then have it, or I'm sorry, put it up over my arms mm -hmm. and like bench press it with it around my arms. And that didn't work. It just hurt. It didn't allow you to bench press any more weight. It didn't take stress off the shoulders or anything like that. But I knew the concept was there because I knew that when you spot somebody on like an incline dumbbell bench press, you usually spot them by their elbows. Mm -hmm. And if you think in terms of what moves the most on a bench press, really the only thing that kind of moves is your elbows. Your elbows move around. Your elbows move back and they move forward. <clears throat> and so I, I thought something needed to be connected to the elbows, but I didn't know what it was going to be or how it was going to look. And so, you know, moving forward, I played around with some different ideas. I one day took a pair of uh, wrist wraps and kind of wrapped them around one elbow, wrapped them around the other elbow, and started kind of moving around with it. My dad was holding it in the middle. Mm -hmm. It was just some old ratty wraps that I had. And uh, I went to pull my arms back, and when I pulled my arms back, the thing exploded and hit my dad in the face. He's like, I don't think you want it to work like that. <laughs> and uh, I was like, no, that's, I think that's actually the feel, though. That's yeah. kind of the feel that I was looking for. And then, you know, from that point, it was a matter of, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how to make this thing. And I did a lot of soul searching, and I tried to, you know, share with people the idea. I tried to share, and... I just kept getting hammered. People were like, that's not a good idea. I don't think that's, that doesn't sound like it's going to do anything. I'm like, no, I think this is like, I think this is a pretty big deal. I think this is huge. I think it could really help a lot of people. I know a lot of people that lift and are like, yeah, but that's your world. That's your lifting world. She's like, that's not, you know, there's not that many people that bench press. I'm like, no, there's a lot of people that bench press. People care about it. And so as I started, you know, examine it more and take it a little further, 
um, I went to some different companies. Uh, they both shut me down and said they didn't see they didn't see it. They didn't see the vision. And so then up from there, I was like, I need to make a prototype to show people what the heck I'm talking about. And once I made the prototype, and I did that through meeting with my wife's friend. My wife was a Division One swimmer for the University of Kansas, and she still swims to this day in a, a master's swim program. She said, hey, I, you know, at swim, at swim practice, one of my friends uh, sews up swimsuits. I was like, okay, that's what I need. I need someone that can sew. And so I brought her a bunch of uh, just knee wraps, things you wrap around your knees to squat more weight. And I said, hey, sew these together like this, and this will make this thing I'm trying to create. She did that. I met her at a Starbucks, um, and then I, tr I tried the product on, and I walked right over. The, right next to the Starbucks was a Fitness 19. Walked in there and benched 135 and 225, and it, it uh, helped alleviate pressure off my shoulders and elbows, and it, it would slingshot the weight out of the bottom mm -hmm. of the lift mm -hmm. the way that I was hoping for. And I got up off the bench, and I was just like covered head to toe in, in goosebumps because I was so excited. Mm. I was like, oh, my God, this is, this is what I wanted to do. <clears throat> and then from there, it was kind of a matter of um, figuring out how to kind of like mass produce it and yeah. things like that. Wow, man, that's an awesome story. Like that's some, like you're Edison of like fitness, <laughs> you know, like just kind of trying, <clears throat> experimenting, finding things yeah. that don't work, but you knew where the final destination, you know. Wow, that's awesome, man. And so one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, of course, is to talk about getting stronger. And um, But I think one of the biggest misconceptions, or maybe it's not, like, but just from my perspective, is that like you even broke world record in like the squat, mm -hmm. I believe. And this, there was a time we didn't think humans could squat over 1,000 pounds, but <laughs> you were one of the people that actually did that. Um, but if people want to get stronger in those you know, general power lifts, the bench, the deadlift, and the squat. Should that be all they focus on, or should there be some variety involved in, in their training? There's so many different uh, attributes of strength. I mean, uh, you'll even hear somebody say, hey, stay strong, you know, when somebody's fighting an illness or somebody has a, something happen in their life, they go through a divorce, someone will say, strong, you know, stay strong. There's so many different variations of strength and, and willpower and, and um, even just in terms of like gymnastics, like is a smaller gymnastics guy or girl who's holding themselves up on those rings, are they not as strong as I am? Like I, I can't hold myself up like that. So they're demonstrating just a different level of strength. Mm. And then someone like a Hussein Bolt, you know, you might not think like that he's powerful, but that's one of the most powerful people to ever walk the face of the earth. Nobody has ever demonstrated to be able to produce more force than somebody like that. He's uh, on the ground, you know, less time than, than anybody in history because he's able to produce so, for, so much force. He's able to basically projectile himself through the air faster than anybody, anybody can fathom, right? And so there's many different forms of strength, and I think for that reason, you do want to be able to demonstrate your strength in some different ways. I mean, it would be nice to be able to uh, bench squat, deadlift something because they have great value in terms of... Um, in terms of kind of like getting your money's worth type of thing. Those are kind of the, the exercises you're going to get the most bang for your buck out of. Not a lot has changed in fitness when it comes to that kind of thing. So you got a bench, you have a squat, you have a deadlift, you have an overhead press, you have a bent over row, you got pull-ups, you got push-ups, and then you kind of start running out of exercises that are super effective. Then mo from there, it's... Um, it's not that a clean and jerk is not effective. All those are super effective, but those are variations of squats. A clean and jerk and a snatch and the Olympic lifts and stuff, those are all still, it just becomes a giant variation. And then there's machines, and they all have their place. <clears throat> but to answer the question very directly, yes, you should be strong in a bunch of different ways, and I think you should be able to demonstrate some strength through your upper body. You should be able to demonstrate some strength through your lower body. Um, you might hear somebody say, like, you should be able to, like, hip hinge, or you should be able to, like, you know, do, like, a knee bend. A knee bend is a squat. Hip hinge is a deadlift. Upper body strength demonstration could be pull-ups. It could be a bench press. It could be push-ups. But, yeah, it is, it is great to be able to demonstrate some sort of strength in all these different avenues. If you try to pursue towards one thing too heavily, whether it's to be leaner or whether it's to be stronger, then other things will fall apart. 
So if you're trying to be really, really strong, you're not going to be great at tying your shoes. <laughs> if you're trying to get really, really super lean, you most likely will not be very strong. And then you try to find a happy medium between the two. And that's, I think what most people are struggling with is, and most of the people in my, in my world are struggling with, yeah. they like being strong, but they don't want to be fat or they don't even want to be like puffy. You know, they, they want to be, they want to be leaned out. They want to have the abs. And so they're like, man, how do I, how do I have abs and lift heavy? If it's, if it's kind of unnatural for you to have abs, if you have to really, really, really work at it, then for you to have abs, you are going to lose strength because you'll have to lose a significant amount of weight. And so it's hard to find that, kind of find that balance. Yeah, yeah. And I know that a lot of people think about that, you know, a lot of the listeners too, you know. Um, so just to give a specific example, what if we want to get stronger in our deadlift, mm -hmm. you know, from whatever we're at? Obviously, if people are just getting started, just get started with the basic mm -hmm. stuff, you know, just get started yeah. with the barbell and some, you know, light plates. But what are some exercises? Just say somebody's got a little bit of experience in deadlifting. What are some um, complementary things that we can be doing along with the deadlift? And maybe just even a couple of insights about deadlifting itself. So again, you know, to kind of bench squat deadlift are going to be great because they're going to work so many different muscles at one time. Barbell exercises are amazing because they're barbell exercises and barbell exercises are detrimental because they're barbell exercises. So bench squat and deadlift are, are amazing because you can use so much weight in them. And normally when I do like a strength training seminar, I'll say, you know, who in the room has lifted 400 pounds? A couple hands will go up. I'll say 500 pounds and eventually usually it stops at like 600 pounds. And I'll say, okay, what lift was that done in? And they'll say a deadlift. And I'll say, okay, does everybody kind of understand that like this is going to be one of the better ways that we can overload the body? Does everybody kind of agree so we can kind of move forward? Because overloading the body is going to give us a great stimulus, going to help with bone density, going to help with increased muscle mass, going to give us the most bang for our buck. It's going to be really hard to get big and strong if all we're doing is like overhead squats. Overhead squats are it's a great exercise. How much weight can you use in an overhead squat? Probably not that much. So if we're trying to actually add muscle mass, which by the way should be everyone's goal, I'll repeat that again, which by the way should be everyone's goal because the muscle pays for the party. You don't have to look like me and be stuck together and, and have trouble uh, scratching your own knee or something like that. You can have more mobility than that. You don't have to uh, get that muscle bound, but it is important to have muscle because it, muscle is going to uh, help shift your metabolism. It's gonna help help you to be able to eat more for those of you that love to eat. <laughs> and I see a lot of people spending, you know, countless hours, you know, on a row or countless hours on a, a treadmill or something like that. And those can be effective ways to burn some calories. But it's nice when your body is actually working for you and you're not a slave to your own body. When it comes to when it comes to deadlifting, or when it comes to any of these lifts, but when it comes to a deadlift, it's like, let's just try to break it down a little bit. What do we need? Well, we need a strong grip. Um, and, to, and in order to have a strong grip, you're gonna need strong biceps and a strong forearm because the body is so intelligent and so smart that if there's a weak link, your, your hands will no longer be able to hold onto it anymore. Yeah. Your biceps are like, even though you're not trying to curl the weight, you're trying to let your arms be extended as much as you can, your body is gonna say, this is not a good idea, you need to drop this. And same thing happens when your back rounds over. A lot of times your back will round over and then the weights kind of go into your fingertips and your body is just sending this message like, dude, you need to let go of that. Like you're too rounded over, you're gonna get hurt. And so you usually kind of drop the bar. The best way to get strong and the best way to improve on something like a deadlift is to only go to a technical limit. So you wanna lift and you wanna push it and you wanna work hard, but you don't wanna go so hard that you're failing all the time. You don't want to, <clears throat> you know, you'll hear a bodybuilder say you want to go to failure and sometimes train through failure and they'll do like spotted lifts. We don't really do that in powerlifting. In fact, a lot of great powerlifters, the best powerlifters I've ever seen, they'll go to do a lift and they'll pull on the weight and then they'll just kind of shake their head and they'll, they'll stop. And they might restart and they might lift it again or they might even decrease the weight. And that's really hard to do because our ego gets in the way. We want to always lift more. Yeah. But it's not necessarily about lifting more. It's about lifting better. Yeah. And the definition of like what powerlifting truly is, 
It's you're trying to move throughout an entire range of motion while maintaining position. And when you start to see people do that in person, when you go to a powerlifting meet and you see a female do it with 400 pounds or 500 pounds, or you see a guy deadlift seven, eight, 900 pounds and their back is still flat, you're, to me, it's like magical. You're like, this guy is a, and this girl, is, they're, these are geniuses. Mm. Because who else can figure out a way to organize their body in that fashion and be able to demonstrate that amount of strength? And their ability to recruit, recruit that many muscle fibers at one time, it's just insane. And it doesn't always get enough credit. But the only way that those people are able to actually get anywhere is if they always are training to the absolute limit, they're not going to recover from their workouts. And this is where you and I line up really well with the sleep. I feel like I have power lifted everything in my entire life. Power lifting is you do a lift, you go at it really hard, and then you recover. Mm, right. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, sometimes 10 minutes in between sets. The harder the lift, the longer the rest is. When you were, we're in competition, when we're in competition, it starts out with the squat. And you have three attempts on a squat, three attempts on a bench, and three attempts on a deadlift. And depending on how big the competition is, is how long it will be until your next turn. It's almost always like 12 minutes in between each, each set that you do. Think about that, you know, for some of your listeners, some of the people listening right now, to have 12 minutes in between a set, that's excessive. But that's what happens a lot of times in a powerlifting meet. It's because they want to see those athletes have the absolute best opportunity to make that weight again. So you're not going to be able to make the weight unless you're recovered. The recovery aspect of it, though, all starts with, because people ask me all the time, what do you do for recovery? What do you do for treatment? What do you do for this? I don't do much because I try to train the best that I possibly can. I try to train optimally. I find weights that are optimal and not maximal. Mm. That's the biggest issue is people are lifting too heavy. So they think, I'm going to go to the gym. All right, Mark Bell said I need a deadlift. And so they're going to go to the gym, and they're going to try three plates, and they're, they're going to barely make three plates, and it's going to be really crappy for them. The next week they're going to try it again. <clears throat> next week they're going to try it again. <clears throat> they're not allowing themselves any room to really make any progress because the body is only learning how to do, do the lift um, improperly, not really ever learning how to do it the right way. And so a great way to know what amount of weight you need on the bar, you should be able to talk to yourself while you're doing it. So if you're somebody that lifts around 300 pounds, try talking yourself through 225 and try five reps and say, okay, uh, I'm going to try to keep my chest up. I'm going to try to keep my back flat. I'm going to try to keep my stomach tight. And I'm going to try to continue this form all the way up until I lock the weight out and all the way back down to the ground. And I'm going to do all five reps that way. And I'm going to have perfect reps on every single thing that I do for the day. Mm. That's how you want to strength train. Mm. Love that, man. Precise. Yeah, that's so good. <clears throat> so... Uh, staying on the lane, and again, we're just using a deadlift as an mm -hmm. example. Um, so we've got the deadlift itself. So you mentioned building up the biceps and forearms would be incredibly helpful, obviously, with the grip. So what about things like bands? Like bands are super mm -hmm. popular now. So what are, what are your thoughts on bands and things like chains? Like yeah. how do those work into it? Yeah, so bands and chains are sometimes put on the bar. And that's called accommodating resistance. And... What that is supposed to do is supposed to allow you to, to apply more force, and it's supposed to give you a more optimal weight, which it usually it, it, it does. It kind of depends on the lift. It kind of depends on what the lifter needs. <clears throat> but from what I've seen is it will help you to be faster. And so if you can get through the lift faster, just as an example, you know, if you're, again, if your max deadlift is around 300 pounds and you're trying to pick that up, if I ask you to pick it up and take five seconds to stand up with it, and then take five seconds to bring it back down, you're gonna lose a lot of energy. You're gonna be super gassed by the yeah. time you get done with that set. Now, if you can take that same set, and I say, just go at it, you know, go as hard as you can, you might be able to bust out five or six reps, you know, in the amount of time it took you to do that one rep. Mm -hmm. That same example of lifting the weight five seconds under super control happens automatically when the weights get too heavy. You go to lift the weight, 
and it takes like three seconds or so for you to break inertia, for you to get momentum, for you to break the weight off the ground. And then it may take a few more seconds for you to lock the weight out. But the question you always have to go back and ask yourself is, not can I lift more, but can I lift it better? It's the same message you have with your sleep. It's not about more, this is about better. Can, can we make this more optimal? How do we, <clears throat> what would it look like if you just did every rep perfectly? What would it look like if we went in the gym and yeah, let's say I can bench 225, but what would it look like if I went in the gym and I benched 185 for five sets of three reps, really super clean and crisp? Am I gonna walk away on that day with any injuries? Probably not, probably gonna feel pretty good. Um, am I going to walk away with maybe a little better understanding of how I should bench press, where I should bring the bar, where my grip should be? Um, are you kind of like learning along the way? Because that's what this process really is. You're trying to like bake all this stuff into your head and bake it into your body, into your cells, into your DNA, and into every aspect of everything that you're doing mm. so that you know, so that it's ingrained. But you have to have the rest, you have to have the recovery, and it's boring message. And it's, it's boring to lift a certain way like this, but those are, those are the key ingredients. The bands and the chains, they accommodate resistance. They allow you to apply more force so it can give you an opportunity. They say mass is, uh, or force times mass is acceleration, or however I'm messing that up, I'm sure I'm messing that up. But it's, it's you know, you're trying to apply as much force as possible to the amount of weight that you have on the bar. Mm. And you're trying to move it as quickly as you can. And the bands can help you demonstrate that better. So like if we had, if, um, if I gave you a wiffle ball, if I gave you a tennis ball, a baseball, and a shot put, I said throw all, these, throw all of these things, you know, one at a time, the baseball would travel the furthest because it's the most optimal weight for what I asked you to do. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to find in the gym. What's the mm -hmm. most optimal weight? And if you're gonna like hurt yourself with anything, trying to throw the shot put really fast, if you've never thrown a shot put, it would probably hurt pretty bad. But actually throwing the wiffle ball really fast would probably hurt too. Mm, right. And so in training, you can't use really, really light weights and try to move them super fast because your body is, your, especially like in the case of a bench press, your body is gonna tell you, hey man, like if you lock your elbows out that fast, you're gonna blow them apart. So you can't like go crazy and drive, drive your elbows into weight that's not there. Yeah. And then same thing with like a deadlift, you might kind of hyperextend your back or something like that. Your body is gonna automatically wanna decelerate a little bit and slow down. And that's what the bands and chains help you do. They help you to, um, they help you to accelerate, help you to speed up. Yeah. Kind of like jumping, you know, if you're to jump up on this table, mm -hmm. you can't really jump up on a table slow. You can't lift with bands or chains mm -hmm. slow. So it's supposed to be training, uh, training you for speed and they can be really effective. Perfect. So. Uh, just for example, if you have the deadlift bar, the barbell, and then you have bands attached to mm -hmm. maybe something on the floor that's around the uh, barbell itself, the outside of the yep. barbell. So it's going to have effectively no added resistance on the floor, but as it goes up, mm -hmm. it increases the resistance. Is that how it works? That's 100% how it works. And the chains are the same way. Like more and more chain weight will collect on the ground. Right. The chains that we use in my gym are about 20 pounds a piece. So... Each link, as it's hitting the ground, there's less and less of that chain on the bar, and there's more and more as you come back up. The huge advantage in terms of like muscle building is that there's constant tension on there. Hmm. So if you wanted to, now I'm saying you're trying to move through these weights as fast as possible, hmm. but if you wanted to slow it down and build muscle, it's even it's amazing for that as well because now you can slow down. You have constant tension on it, and you kind of think about like. What's the hardest part of a deadlift? What's the hardest part of a squat? What's the hardest part of a bench? Under normal circumstances, it's the bottom of the bench press that's the hardest. It's the bottom of the squat that's the hardest. And it's the bottom of the deadlift that's the hardest. So in these cases, when you're using accommodating resistance, when you have a band, a chain on there, or even in the case of my product, a slingshot, the weight is actually lightest at the bottom of the lift. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the bench press, that's where you're in the least advantageous position. That's where your shoulders are at most risk. So some uh, coaches and stuff will say, hey, you know, if we're going to bench press at all, don't even go full range of motion because they don't want their athletes to uh, injure their shoulders because when both your arms are pinned back behind your body with two or 300 pounds, it's, 
it's a very unnatural movement. Yeah. And even, you know, as we start to squat and deadlift more, it becomes an unnatural movement as well. But the bands and chains are going to allow you to train through those areas that might otherwise be harmful with a lesser amount of weight. As you get into a more advantageous position, as you go to lock out a deadlift or a squat or a bench press, um, more and more weight is coming onto the bar as you're getting into a better position. Mm, yeah. You know, I was trying to find creative ways to, because I would, my shoulders would get a little junky mm -hmm. doing flat bench. And um, so I would start to like put like a pad or something on my or chest or block or roll up a, um, a mat or something, yeah, yeah. you know, like I was just do a rudimentary thing at the gym. And also I've seen people, um, a friend who's been on the show, Don Saladino, um, do presses in the squat rack, mm -hmm. right? Where he's got the, the arms of the squat rack there to a prevent pin, it from pin going pin press, yeah. Yeah, so that's called a pin press. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's so many different ways to train. That's kind of like a, almost like an isometric form of training. So you have to overcome... It's like a the, box squat. Yeah, you have to overcome the weight just sitting there. And that, that's a, that is an amazing exercise, uh, but that one hurts a lot. So mm -hmm. for anybody that hasn't done it, it just takes a lot to get something uh, mm -hmm. from like a static right. position. Yeah. You're going to definitely feel that one like in your elbows and your shoulders and stuff. The nice thing is, though, you can limit the range of motion. So if you do have a shoulder mm -hmm. injury or something like that, uh, you can have a shorter range of motion. Normally, you can lift more weight on those things, too. There's a time and place for all that. Sometimes when something just automatically allows you to lift more weight, if it's not, like, going to support you, um, then there's just more risk of injury. So if you can normally bench press, you know, 200 pounds, and now you can all of a sudden on this partial range of motion movement use 300 pounds, most of your body is like, hey, we've never done this amount of weight before. This isn't a great yeah, idea. Yeah. And then sometimes you pay the price. Mm. But there are good movements. You know, when you were talking about the chains, and you said that like 20, 25 pounds at your gym, mm -hmm. it made me think of the Junkyard Dog, <laughs> yeah. WWF. So Old you school were, wrestling. Yeah, man. I was like super into I would literally ride my bike to a place called Star Video and rent like the Royal Rumbles and all the stuff like oh, when so they would good. come back out. Um, so like Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Macho Man, yeah. Ultimate Warrior, all that stuff. But that was like a big inspiration for you too when you oh, were I younger, right? Yeah, me and my brothers, we all loved wrestling. My oldest brother, Mike, he was a professional wrestler. He yeah. was also uh, really big into, into football and stuff. And I just, I kind of followed whatever he was doing. Yeah. And my brother, Chris, was a bigger influence when it came to the actual uh, powerlifting stuff. Uh, but yeah, pro wrestling, we were enamored by it. You know, uh, my uh, my uncle would show us uh, the uh, the Road Warriors, Animal and yeah, Hawk, and these man. guys were huge. They were jacked. And I remember seeing the Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan, and all these guys were, you know, uh, larger than life. Then my dad would take us to some of the uh, some wrestling and stuff. And yeah, we were like, okay, well, what's the deal with these guys? How do they get you know big yeah. and strong? And so. We're like, well, whatever the heck they're doing, we need to we need to figure that out too. And then that's when we started getting more into like weights and stuff like that and other sports. But yeah, I've always loved uh, professional wrestling, and my oldest brother was so into it that he actually got into professional wrestling. Right. Was in the WWF then? Yeah, yeah. He was in the WWF and he wrestled like the Undertaker and yeah. Bret Hart, and he wrestled all those different kind of people. And then I followed in his footsteps as well. And ended up wrestling in uh, Ohio Valley Wrestling, which is like kind of like a minor leagues for WWE type stuff. And I ended up, uh, you know, doing some stuff with WWE a couple times here and there. But, you know, having that experience, you know, people ask me about like business uh, failures. And in terms of business, everything I've done business wise has always been with my wife. And so because it's a family oriented thing, we take baby steps. Mm. And so we really. Not that we've been perfect, but we really haven't really messed up when it comes to what we're doing business-wise. We, we, we're always going to spend a little and, and see how it works, and then if it works working good, we'll spend more. And so therefore, most of the stuff that we've tried has worked pretty good. But wrestling was one place where I did fall on my face. It was a place where I failed, and it was hard. It was extremely challenging. I mean, just like many other kids, too, I wanted to be a pro football player, but you kind of realize your hopes and dreams for that can run out as well. You realize maybe you're not as fast as the next guy, you're not as this or that, and that gets to be really difficult as well. But as I was transitioning from football into uh, pro wrestling, I thought that pro wrestling would be easier in some way than football, and I thought it'd be a little easier to navigate. 
And the men and women that are in professional wrestling, they are so athletic, it's unbelievable. Mm. But that's, I mean, that's not the only thing that held me back either. Um, you know, you have to, you hear so many people talking about you got to find your passion. And, and, and then you're kind of like, I keep hearing the same darn message from everybody. You better love whatever it is that you get into because you need to have the energy to do it all the time. Mm. If you're going to be great. Yeah, if you're going to be great. And what I always loved was lifting. But I lifting was like... Uh, this like annoying girlfriend or something that I could never get rid of, you know, and I, I, I just didn't realize like that was the one for me from the beginning, yeah. you know, from the time I was 12, but I'd always like shun powerlifting and I'd be like, no, nah, I'm going to be a football player. No, I'm going to be a pro wrestler. And I was always kind of chasing after these other things. And that's why sometimes I'll tell people like powerlifting, I feel like it almost chose me mm-hmm. because I, it just it keeps showing back up, you know, at my front door. And I'm like, go away, <laughs> slamming the door in his face. And, and I mean, even as uh, maybe about three months ago, I went and competed again and benched over 500 pounds again. So it's like I just can't, I can't get away from it. It's just, it just keeps ending up there. But the experiences in pro wrestling, when I saw people like Shelton Benjamin, uh, multiple, uh, multiple, all-American uh, at the University of Minnesota in, in uh, collegiate wrestling, Brock Lesnar, John Cena. Uh, when I've seen how athletic and how built these guys were, especially for me at the time, I was like, I can't, I don't know, I can't figure out whatever it is these guys are doing. I don't, I don't have some of that. And a, a really valuable message that came from pro wrestling and something that sticks in my head forever that came from my dad. My dad's a huge influence on my life. But my dad has taught me, he said, part of knowing who you are is knowing who you're not. And I feel like that's such an easier thing to land on, just knowing like, oh, I'm not like him, and I'm not like her, and I'm not like this person. And it's it's easier to not be like disappointed in yourself because it's okay to not be like that person because you don't really need to try to be like that person anyway. But maybe they could not be like you in some other way. You know, maybe you can figure out a way to get ahead. Maybe you can figure out a way to kind of find your own niche. So when I was kind of, when I saw, I remember remember Shelton Benjamin, he hopped up on the top turnbuckle from inside the ring, and then he ran around the uh, entire ring, like on the top rope, without holding anybody's hand or anything. He just like, you know, ran around the ring. And then he did a backflip into the ring. And I was like, whatever that is, I don't have that. I can't do that. (laughs) That's the Nacho Libre, man. That's crazy. And there's some people that are, yeah, some people like, with these positive affirmations and things like that, I can get behind some of these things. And I believe in some of this stuff, but I also believe that it's nonsense in some way. That if you if you haven't proved yourself to yourself, then you got nothing. You have to figure out a way to at least prove yourself to yourself a little bit. So every time that you set a goal, you can say, you know what, I've set other goals before. I, I You know what, I bet if I went after that with everything I had, I bet you I can... I can do that and I think that's really important for people to understand it's like if you if you haven't really proved yourself yet on anything you're gonna have to find something you kept mentioning kind of like the low-hanging fruit I agree a hundred percent find something small find something easy I had a friend the other day he's been lifting with me I lift at 4 a.m. he's been lifting with me for the last few months he's and I started talking about weight loss he's been already training with me he already know he knows my diet he sees it all and we haven't really talked a lot about nutrition. I'm letting him, letting him do his own thing. He's coming in, he's training. We're good. You know, I've talked to him a little bit about nutrition, but we haven't really hammered it. He started to ask some more questions. I said, you know what, dude? It's time that we kind of put a time domain on this, and let's, let's start work on trying to drop some weight. Let's make you a little bit more uh, accountable for this. But he said, you know what? When I first started, all I wanted to do is be consistent. And I was like, that is that is so good because... Yeah. You wanted something that you felt was simple enough for you to do. And I was like, how hard has it been for you to show up on a scale of 1 to 10? He's like, a 3. In comparison to other things that you've done in your life, it's yeah. a 3, right? So that that's the kind of stuff that you want to look for in your life. What is that thing that you can do that would be pretty simple for you to get started on? Maybe not easy, but simple. Yeah, I love that, man. And I love that you said it was like that annoying girlfriend. <laughs> Power lift it was. <laughs> Just like sending that text, you up? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, guy, huh? And so also, you know, you getting involved in two areas that are like 
very from the public perception it's just like we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes with wrestling mm -hmm. and also with powerlifting as well and you're one of the people that's been really honest about um performance enhancing drugs mm -hmm. and unlike you know people like barry bonds and all these folks are like no 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 it's like a big part of the culture and so i'm wondering for you personally when you or, you know, just say getting into the space a little bit more with powerlifting mm -hmm. or wrestling or whatever and just seeing like this is the culture, this is what people are doing. Like what were your initial thoughts on it and what got you to the place where you was like, you know what, I'm going to start to experiment with some of this stuff and try to figure out how it works in my particular goals because if I'm wanting to be the best in this space, this is what people are doing. As a kid, I looked at performance enhancing drugs and I was like, oh, that's very clear, that's cheating. When you take when you take that, and I still view it that way, just to be totally clear. Because, and what I mean by that is, it's cheating in the UFC, where they're very clear about what performance enhancing drugs that they test for. And if you and I are to fight, uh, we're we're both agreeing. We signed a contract. We're, we're not supposed to be taking this stuff, right? And the NFL footballs like that, or baseballs like that. A lot of sports are like that. Powerlifting and bodybuilding. They have other things that you can go into if you want to be drug tested. And so therefore, you know, I've been a huge powerlifting proponent and a huge powerlifting fan since I was a kid. Once I started to kind of learn that, as a kid, I was always in the drug tested federations. And I, I always admired the, the guys that were drug free. But as I moved forward, I just kind of recognized it seemed very similar. The guys that were taking steroids and the guys that weren't taking steroids, both guys were stuck. It's just that each guy made a decision to take it a certain distance or had certain, uh, you want to call them like values or moral values or whatever it was. One guy decided, hey, those aren't for me. I'm not sticking myself with that needle. And another guy decided, you know what, I am going to make that jump. Just where I, th you know, for me personally, where I kind of think it's cheating is when somebody's doing it and they're not talking about it. Mm. And they're not telling you about it. Like if I'm going to share with you, you know, some progress I made, for a bodybuilding show, or I'm gonna tell you how I lost a bunch of weight, even if it's in a book. It's like, I have to mention it every time. I have to say, I take performance enhancing drugs, because as you know, it changes the hormonal profile of everything so yeah. much. I mean, if we slapped another 10 pounds of muscle on you, it would be so much easier for you to regulate how much body fat your body has. Yeah. It does make it easier, it is a cheat code. But it's also a cheat code that you can only play one time. So you, um, Maybe you made it to you know a certain level, uh, you know without taking them, and and it's it's going to jump you up a little bit, but it's not going to make you go from barely making a Division One uh, track team to all of a sudden being an Olympic gold medalist. Right. If you are already really talented in track and you already are, you know, finishing top five in the world, and then you take them, it might. Track's not a great example because yeah. <laughs> so many of the track athletes are on performance enhancing drugs. Yeah. But you get the idea, it's like, you know, once you kind of play that card, the card is played and it's um, it's kind of hard to negotiate whether you take them or whether you don't take them. Yeah. Um, for me, it was actually a really hard decision. I remember I, and this is something I share with people too, like don't, just be open with people, you know, tell people, like if you have somebody else living in your house, if you're with somebody else, you're married or whatever, don't tell your girlfriend you're taking creatine or something, just, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to find out that your girlfriend smokes pot or even if it doesn't matter what thing it is. I mean, even if they had like a little flask and they hit some alcohol here and there, you'd be like, hey, like, you know, why, how come we can't talk about yeah. I'd like to know more about like what's going on. Why are you doing that? You know, and so I always share with people like don't hide it from people. And certainly if you're a kid, you got to wait until you're old. You got to wait till you're out of your parents house. You also got to wait till you're. Uh, mature enough until you have done something with your lifting and you've done something with your body uh, before you ever even really mess with it. Taking it at a super young age is, is not, a, not a great idea. But I remember having the conversation with my wife and I was crying. I was like, I'm like, babe, I'm like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to like make this jump. This is weird. Like, I don't want to inject this like oil into my body. She's like, well, why are you doing it? I was like, I don't know. I'm obsessed with this stuff. I want to I've been working at this for a really long time. I think I was about 25, which is still pretty damn young. Yeah. Looking back, probably should have started a little bit later. But I, I've already been lifting since the time I was 12. I was like, I want to see, like, you know, I want to see if I can 
you know, break these all-time records. I want to see if I can go after some of this stuff. And probably my mistake in all that was maybe, like, maybe worrying about the way that other people got to those goals. And maybe I should not have focused on that. But that's, to me, that, that's what was in my head. Um, it wasn't really an excuse on why I couldn't be stronger, why I couldn't be bigger. But at the same time, it was there. I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to lift these kind of weights probably forever-ish, you know, give or take some weight, right? Uh, but if I do this and I'm all in, then it changes everything. And so, you know, it was a tough decision to make, but, you know, I, I made it and I, I tried to be op as open as I could be. I still get a lot of comments on Instagram, you know, if I post up like a transformation picture or something. I don't mention it every single time. Yeah. So there's always that guy who's like, hey, man, he's on steroids. And people just have a certain uh, perception about it. And I'll just write back and I'll say, yeah, I am. I talked about it in a movie. Got any questions about it? Let me know. Let me know Let me know what you need to know. And so that's kind of my vantage point on it. Yeah. The reason I wanted to talk about it with you specifically is, I, first of all, obviously the honesty, which is difficult because of the stigma. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, it's one of those things that is so crazy because things that are statistically much more dangerous, like alcohol consumption oh, yeah. and you know, various drugs is socially acceptable, mm. um, where this is not socially acceptable. Now, I'm not saying I agree with any of it, right. but people are going to do things that they believe are, you know, good for them or fun for them in right. a sense, you know, or moving them towards the goal that they want, whether it's drinking some alcohol or whether it's the performance enhancing drugs. And so I think that the big thing that I want you to kind of get across is, um, where this is appropriate and where it's in that level of, of dangerous. Just like with, mm -hmm. for example, with alcohol, we can get in that place of addiction, you know, and with steroids or with, you know, performance enhancing drugs, it's that addiction to right. that goal or to being that person, right? And so once you start, it's very difficult to like not be that strong big guy, right? So what, where, where do we get into that place of like, you even mentioned like 25 might yeah. be too young, but how is there an age that is old enough, you know, to make a decision like that? I think if you've been training for a long time and you've been honest about how you've been training, you've been diligent with your nutrition and with your sleep and you have things, you, you have things pretty cleaned up and you feel comfortable because steroids are not going to make you, they're not going to all of a sudden make you lean either. I think that's a perception that's out there too. I think some people just think it's all of a sudden going to, add 10 pounds of body weight and make it very, very simple to lose weight. And they can help you increase size. They can help you add more muscle mass, but it will not clean your diet up for you. You'll have to figure that, you'll have to get that stuff uh, taken care of and situated on your own. And so if those things are all situated and you've been training for several years, usually uh, most people get to like where they're gonna end up forever at about 10 years. And I think that uh, steroids prolong that for maybe an additional five. So as sad as that is to say, um, you can, it's probably even a shorter window than this, probably only like about eight years or so that you got before you reach your peak at just about anything, whether you're doing jiu-jitsu, boxing, track, uh, you name it. You're, I mean, look at these young girls that win Olympic gold medals and like figure skating and stuff. They can do it for about a decade. You know, they start at like three and then they're in the Olympics at like 13, 14, right? There's gymnastics and different sports are a little different, but you get the idea, like that's kind of your window, that's your time frame. And the steroids can help extend that time out a little bit more. But one thing I would say about steroids and performance enhancing drugs is I think that it is a life altering decision. Um, so you have to really think about it. Do you, if you really, really love lifting, then the odds of you being addicted to it are going to be huge. Because what, you're just going to all of a sudden go back? Like, what am I going to do? Am I going to just disappear and all of a sudden not be able to lift those same amount of weights? Um, those weights are so attached to who I am in my own head, whether it's true or not. They're so attached to who I am that it would be really, really hard to just all of a sudden be like, Yep, I'm shifting. It would take a lot of courage and a lot of strength, and I'm not saying I don't have the courage or strength to do that. But what is it's people that are just starting? They need to really think about what's their exit strategy going to look like, or they're just never going to exit out of it. For me, I'm now in my 40s, so I'm like, well, I'll probably just ride them out until <laughs> until I'm not around anymore. I'll also point out too that they're dangerous. 
steroid, any drug that you take is dangerous. So you have to kind of weigh the pros and cons of it. What, what's it going to look like for you? What's this going to do for you? Is it going to give you bigger arms and, and give you a bigger chest and make you feel better about yourself? If it is, then that, that seems pretty good to me. That seemed like pretty positive to me. Um, is it going to negatively impact your life? Is it going to hurt your job? Is it going to hurt someone close to you? Is it going to, wh what's the consequences of it all? What's yeah. it, what's it all going to uh, look like? And, you know, being the person that takes them, it's hard to know, you know, what everybody truly feels about them. Yeah. And, uh, it's different for, uh, people that I don't know to talk about it or whatever. It's, it's like, doesn't matter as much, but like, I don't know how it impacts my kids. I don't know how much they know or don't know. I don't know how much they've seen a bigger, stronger, faster. Uh, I don't know like what my son knows and doesn't know. But yeah, of course it would kill me if, if it was something that hurt him. He's like, oh man, I was looking up to my dad. I thought he was strong on his own or something. Because that's what we do yeah. societally, period, is mm -hmm. those wrestlers were our idols or yeah. you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever. And you know, to, to believe that we can work hard. Because what did Hulk Hogan say? Something about like eat your vitamins and like- Yeah, train, say your prayers and eat your vitamins. <laughs> that's how you get to be Hulk Hulkamaniac, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But it was He's actually- talking about different vitamins. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know, and it's just like, so where do we draw the line is kind of what I'm trying to to, to get so, to, just to give people another perspective. Yeah, because so you know, is, I know this is like, this is, this is what I really respect about you is the ability to talk about this stuff from your perspective. You know, because there is a lot of stigma, but there's also this, it's very pervasive in our culture. You know, like you mentioned, like in track track athletes. Now, obviously, it's not 100% of the people running track. Shout out to, there's some incredible people yeah. uh, who are in, in a, uh, Olympic level. Of course. Um, athletes who are listening to the show right now. But a lot of people are, you know, they're they're taking something and in, our, in our own lives. And I want us to start to look at this stuff a little differently or in a bigger perspective of, you know, do you are you leaning on that caffeine a little bit too hard? Are you leaning on the alcohol a little bit too hard, or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. um, to get you to where you want to be? And are you at a place where, like you said, you don't know if you're strong enough to stop? You know, and so are you going to ride that out forever? <laughs> so yeah, man, it, it's it's a interesting thing to start to really think about because uh, great music. Great music, so much great music. I know we're in a music rec uh, recording studio. So much great music has come off of people being high, mm. people being under the influence of some things, LSD, marijuana, alcohol. I'm not even saying that's bad necessarily, but it's just a thing, right? It's just it's part of it. A lot of great art, a lot of great things that we have in our society come from uh, things like marijuana. Uh, with Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's the leader. Joe Rogan's the king in the podcast domain, right? He's a friend of mine. Would Joe Rogan be Joe Rogan without the psilocybin mushrooms and and uh, and weed? Like, no, he wouldn't be because his podcast, if you remember, if you go back to the very beginning, it started out, it's just going to be me and my buddy smoking some weed, talking shop. And that's how the whole show started and it exploded. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Is Arnold Schwarzenegger the governor of California? No. Is he Mr. Olympia? No, probably not. I mean, if everybody else doesn't take him, maybe he reaches some of the same spots. Um, but you see like what a rabbit hole we start going down and who, who's completely clean, who's not using something to get an edge. I'm not even really saying there's anything wrong with it. I just think it's something to, and I'm not trying to be defensive of, of my stance at all either, but it is something that people should think about because every person that you put up on a pedestal has probably gotten there by doing something that's maybe a little different than uh, the way that we currently understand it. Yeah, yeah. Wow, man. Again, thank you for yeah, thank sharing you. that and sharing that perspective. And j just to kind of take a step back, because you, you mentioned your son, and my son's over there, and my youngest son is in the other room. And you mentioned on your show, because I've just been diving into your world, and like I think it was your son when he was a baby, he would get up and do the perimeter. Oh yeah, he would go and like every day he had. He to ruined go. my video game life. Yeah, I used to play video games all the time. He ruined it. So every day, <laughs> my son Braden would get up in the morning, and he the first thing he would do, he'd go into the kitchen, open the cabinet, take everything out from under the sink, 
and put it all over the floor. Then you could start your day. Like that's literally how it had to happen. <laughs> and so when I heard that, I was like, so what did your son used to do? Yeah, he would, he would do this. I call it a perimeter walk. He would like shuffle along the wall every single day. And then he would make his way over to where our TV was. And then he would reach down and grab all my DVDs out of there and like chuck them behind him. And a lot of them were uh, video games. And so <laughs> when I would go to play the video game, it like wouldn't work anymore. So he ended my uh, video game career, which I'm sure my wife is uh, <laughs> right, right, right. pretty excited about, you know. Man, that's that another thing that could really just kind of pull you into that world, you know. And so um, because that was my thing, too, man. I was literally I don't know if I've shared this on the show, but when I was dealing with my spine issues, like I was even paying my rent, like hustling playing Madden, you know, like Well now you could do it online, right? Right. You oh could, you could get paid. I did it a couple a couple years ago. I started to play Madden and we got this really incredible TV it's tough and all this stuff. Play people on. online, they're really good. Yeah, man. <laughs> but I got I start to get like oh, I'm I got to beat them, yeah. you know. And I just like I had to shut it down, man, cuz it just pulls you, pulls you right back in there. But um you know, just that experience of like, you know, raising kids and a family yeah. and all that stuff and um for for yourself and i think that you get when why did you choose to like forego the wrestling and um not that you mm -hmm. for 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 went the mm -hmm. the uh, power lifting but when did you decide i'm going to open my own space like what was the inspiration for you to open your own gym the inspiration behind it was uh just pretty selfish i knew that like I couldn't be the best that I wanted to be without support, like without help, without people around me. And um, I knew that it wasn't really going to happen in like a 24-hour fitness type of space. I needed other people that were like-minded, that really liked, they were really loved to lift. They were very serious about it. And so I would just dream about it every day. You know, I'd think about it all the time. I was like, look at that storage unit over there. I bet, I bet if I got just a couple pieces of equipment, i get a couple people to train with me. Because at that point, I felt like I had a pretty good knowledge base and I could get some people to work out with me. And I just kept thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. And then finally, um, I got to a spot that was uh, like 900 square feet. And I was, you know, like, oh, well, if I get a couple lifters in here, the gym wasn't free in the beginning. If I get a couple lifters in here, we can break even and pay the rent and we can kind of start, we can start going from there. And so that's that's what happened. I, it's something that I was so obsessed about, though. I thought about it all the time, and even even in terms of like squatting and deadlifting, and, and not so much bench pressing, but more so the squat and deadlift. I would just like randomly like air squat and randomly like deadlift because I would be thinking about it. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh man, I wonder if I, I wonder if my shin angle was like more like this if I could like deadlift more, or I wonder maybe I should try to open up my stance more on a sumo deadlift tomorrow. And I was just thinking about it all the time. Um, coming up off my couch, I was like squatting or coming up off my toilet, <laughs> I was squatting or didn't matter whatever I was doing. I was so obsessed with it. And I was like, I got it. This is bugging me so much. I got to figure this out. And so uh, eventually my wife and I kind of came together. I'm like, I want to try to do this thing. She's like, and nobody knew what the heck I was doing. Powerlifting was not anywhere at the time. It wasn't popular. And um, we just dove into it and just decided to, to get moving on it. Wow, man! And that was how many years ago? That was that was that was twelve years ago. Twelve years. So how long have you been in this location right now? The spot that so this is like the fifth like iteration of uh, Super Training Gym. It's changed many times over. Now we're in like a the place is like thirty thousand square feet where we have Whoa. our slingshot products and our uh, all the products that we sell are, are under everything's under one roof, which has been kind of the dream and the and the goal from day one was to you know kind of get it to that point. Yeah. And so, uh, obviously, the vast majority of the results that we get in, in the fitness domain comes down to training, nutrition, sleep, and, you know, supplementation, performance-enhancing drugs. Like, that's a smaller percentage, for yeah. sure. We can get some benefits there, but you can't get anywhere without these foundational things. And so, I want to ask you about some more of these foundational things, because you know your stuff, man. Like, it's, it's really remarkable to see what you've been able to achieve, like, physically. And there, there are a lot of people, I think we get stuck in, because, of course, we do want the basics, right? There's, like, those five basic movements, you know, kind of like the hip hinge and all that stuff. But what about, like, single leg stuff, mm. you know? Is there any, uh, should we be giving any credence to doing that, like, single leg deadlifts and st step up? Like, what do you think? 
I'll first say, you know, that, which is something I haven't mentioned quite yet, is the fastest way to get strong, and it beats steroids, and it beats it beats everything. I mean, you're you're gonna need to still be well rested. You can't really do much with that. You're gonna still need some hydration. But the fastest way to get really strong is just to weigh a lot, just to just to get yourself bigger. Figure out a way to get bigger, and one way to do that is gonna be through your sleep and through your food and through your nutrition. So people that are listening and like, I just want a little tip on how to get, not everybody wants to make that sacrifice though, because as you get bigger, you are gonna get fatter. So sometimes people don't want that, but a larger muscle or even a even just having like a, a larger stomach, you're gonna be able to squat more weight. You're gonna have a bigger base underneath you. And whether it be fat or whether it be muscle or a combination thereof, um, it helps with uh, compression. You know, like if I go to move my, my forearm back towards my bicep, my forearm and my bicep touch each other pretty early because my forearm is fairly big and my bicep is fairly big. So it's gonna, it's gonna give you some compression. It's gonna give you leverage uh, advantages. In terms of like single leg stuff and single arm stuff and all these different things, they're all great to utilize. And your training should, if you're not training for like a competition, then, you should be doing all kinds of different, like have a lot of fun with it. Try to figure out, especially like if you're new into fitness and you're just getting into it, don't do all the stuff that you hate. I mean, you might hear somebody kind of give you a speech about like you're only as strong as your weakest link and that's for, that's for competing. If you're not competing, then don't worry about your weakest link. Do the stuff that's fun. Do, you know, I have always said you have to, you know, it's nice to throw yourself a curveball here and there, but really the majority of what you're doing should be underhand pitches mm -hmm. and you should be knocking those suckers out of the park every single day because you want to, that's the whole point of, of working out and exercising is to feel better. And I think we somehow, we're just thinking annihilation. You know, we need to go in there and annihilate. And that's not what we're trying to do. We're just trying to stimulate. We're trying to feel better. I've heard you mention before that if we checked your markers for health after a training session, we could diagnose you with something horrible, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, what if the training session was didn't impede upon those markers of health so badly that you looked like you had a, a blood glucose uh, problem or something like that? That might be a really nice way to train, at least occasionally, right? To where the training, uh, it's like you and I go back and forth between you're doing uh, 10 push-ups and uh, I'm doing 12 calories on the, um, on the bike or something. We go back and forth. I think that would be a really fun, great workout. We'd both be sweating. We'd both be breathing hard. Be, oh, my God, I kicked my butt. But we wouldn't, like, we wouldn't be dead from it, you know, if we did it for, like, 10 or 12 minutes. So um, the, the single, you know, back to the kind of the original question of the single leg and single arm stuff, it, you have to be doing that stuff. And if you're not training for competition, why not start your workouts with stuff like that? I start a lot of my workouts with what would be considered, like, accessory stuff. So for a long time in fitness, people would say, especially if you're doing like Olympic lifting or power lifting, that those are first. They have to be first. Well, why? You know, why? They don't, they don't have to be first. I understand if they're first for football. I understand if they're first for these things because that's when we're going to have the most strength. That's when we're going to have the best coordination. But it's actually kind of nice to be knocked down a few notches from doing a few sets of leg extensions and a few sets of lunges before you actually start your squat. And then what is it doing for you mentally? Mm -hmm. Now you're like, oh my God, I have to, like, I still have to squat. You're like, holy crap, this is going to be a really, really hard workout. And so give, your, give yourself a lot of different uh, stimulus. One thing I like about doing the assistance exercises first, it allows you to get more out of less weight. Mm. So rather than you trying to have to bang around, you know, two plates in a squat and, and trash up your knees and stuff, you might only use uh, one plate because you might have done leg extensions and leg curls and leg press and lunges before you ever even squatted. Wow, that just sounds like <laughs> that sounds like torture. But it's, it's brutal. It also, like you said, the stuff you got to overcome mentally to to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Because I think we can get stuck in um, cruise control with our lifting too. You know, like we can get ourselves up to a point where we we know we got to go in there and kill it with the squat or with the bench press. Mm -hmm. Then everything else is just like you know, leisure. But one what thing if you I make really, that more challenging? Yeah, one, I, I love that. I love leaning into the resistance. You know, like think about in training specifically, you know, as we uh, get stronger, we, we get the opportunity to use more and more weight. And what if we just kind of leaned into the resistance of life and, and took things on and and got excited when something was hard? You said uh, that, that you, um, 
rather than thinking about how uh, like worried you were or how nervous you were uh, for speech, you would just turn that into excitement, mm. you know? So rather than being like, oh my God, tomorrow's like a leg day, what about being like, yeah, tomorrow's leg day, and you know what? I'm gonna do it at 4 a.m. just cause, just cause I feel like being a psychopath today, and go in there and get it done. Do it without coffee, you know? Do do something just a little. Wait. <laughs> yeah. What? 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 Yeah. Do just do it a little different than what you're used to. Try. You know, you're so reliant on pre workout, and you're so reliant on this or that. Try to just make it look a little different. And I, I've learned that over the years from training with guys like Mike O'Hearn. Mike O'Hearn's just over here at Gold's Venice. You'll have to go. Uh, you'll have to have him on your podcast at some point. People will really love him a lot. He's in his 50s. Guy's still st- strong as hell. He's he's in his 50s. Yeah, he's, he, you've seen I him before. I just saw him at, um, looks at amazing. Petros's event. He looks absolutely ridiculous. But he's a guy that will really lean into the resistance of life. And he'll say, okay, you know, when it's going to be the hardest training day, that's when we're going to do our early training. And sometimes on the other days where you're doing smaller muscle groups or easier workouts, those are done a little bit later on in the day. But I, I really like that idea of like just trying to make stuff harder. Um, and you think about the different exercises you have in the gym, it's nice to think, okay, how do I make this easier in the case of something like a slingshot? Or you might think, how do I make this more difficult? And that would be like, you know, what's harder than a lat pull down? Pull ups, you know, mm-hmm. chin ups. And if you really just wanna, if you really don't love to lift, Again, you can kind of bounce around. You can pick some of the things that you like to do, or you can kind of go the torturous route and pick a few of the things that uh, that are just really hard. I think I think CrossFit plays into this really, really well because the CrossFit workouts they don't they're not really complicated. Like no one's like, oh, what is that? I mean, they might have a question on what a particular workout means because they got different names to them. But when you look at it, you're like, oh, my God, that's super simple. I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to rest a minute. And I'm going to do that every minute on the minute until the time's up. And I'm going to work out for 12 minutes. And we're like, oh, cool, this is going to be fun. Then we get halfway through it and realize how hard it is. But it's great that it's uh, simple. Yeah, awesome, man. Um, So recently, because I I saw you back in the day on something. It might have been a YouTube video. It was maybe eight years ago. And you were a lot bigger, you know, there was more of you and you made a switch within the last few years Mm -hmm. of just like being the biggest, strongest person possible, which, you know, somebody who can squat a thousand pounds, um, to more like aesthetics and just kind of leaning down. Like what was the, what triggered you to want to do that? Because I know it's like that balance in our minds of finding that, but like you made a pretty dramatic shift. So what, what inspired that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I had to be, you know, uh, put in my place, I guess. So I, I you know, squatted 1,080. I bench pressed 854 pounds. I've deadlifted 766 pounds. And the whole time I was chasing after these numbers, I just kept going deeper and deeper into this rabbit hole. And I think, you know, there's so much information being shared right now about, you know, wanting to be a better version of yourself or the best version of yourself or trying to be great. It's like, be kind of careful, like, as you, uh, you know, are on that mission to try to be great, uh, that you don't lose sight of just being happy and just being excited about what it is you're doing. Because I just got, I got to a point where I was miserable. Like, I didn't really, like, uh, I was obsessed, but I didn't even love it anymore. It's just like, I was just forcing myself to do it. And uh, I was 330 pounds. I was getting, you know, bigger all the time. And I um, was having trouble sleeping. My legs were always like red. I'd have uh, what's called like pitted edema. So if I push on my like shin, like my that that area would stay sunk in, yeah. like almost like a diabetic. Um, or I didn't. Pregnant. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, I was pregnant. I, I looked pregnant. My stomach was big enough for that. Um, I mean, I was big and strong, but you know, just like little little stuff. Just like you, like you were saying, you had so much trouble walking because of this uh, bone. Uh, degeneration that you had mine was self-induced just from food and I couldn't get around and I was just thinking man this is actually kind of lame because you know there's these people that I see you know being pushed around in a wheelchair and I'm I'm always kind of critical of them here I am judging them uh, of being pushed around around a wheelchair because they basically just ate too much 
And, uh, but I'm turning into that myself, but I'm, I'm a lifter. I'm active. I shouldn't really be that way. So I kept kind of sweeping all this under the rug. I was ignoring that I wasn't able to sleep and just trying to just uh, forge forward. But uh, I eventually, uh, I was in a power of thing meet, and I went to squat 1,085. It was my second squat attempt, and the goal for that contest was to, to, to do 1,100. I should back it up a little bit and say, my goal originally was to squat 800 or squat squat 1,000 pounds and to bench 800 pounds, and I did both those things. But I got greedy and I kept rolling the dice and rolling the dice. Mm-hmm. I already stopped powerlifting. I already retired a few times. I already, like like I said, it keeps coming back. It keeps coming back. Powerlifting just keeps showing up at my front door. And so th- in this contest, the goal was to go for 1,100. I did 1,085 squat. And as I'm coming down the squat, my knee just shoots inward. My other knee kind of shoots outward. And I just kind of get sent, like, towards the, the rack that we're in. And, you know, I just I hit the ground. And, um, you know, from that, from that moment, it was like it just changed everything forever. It was, it was, a, very, it was a big pivot point for me. And that uh, might have been the video I <laughs> sent you this morning of uh, F Your Elbow, is, uh, you know, my once I fell, I was like, all right, well, this might be the last time I'm ever on a platform. So I'm getting up and I'm walking off under my own power. So my teammate came over to me to try to help me, and I kind of shoved him away, and I, I just <laughs> walked off on my own. And uh, not smart enough to go to the doctor or the hospital or anything like that. I just went on with everything, but... I was in a crazy amount of pain for about three months. It took me about 45 minutes just to go from my couch, um, or sorry, from our uh, recliner to our couch where we had like a rollout bed. I couldn't go upstairs and and, uh, sleep with my wife because uh, my leg was too mangled and messed up and stuff. So I got really, really screwed up from that, but it was a message of like, dude, you need to slow down. And why not, you know, take this time. You can't be strong. There's, you can't squat. You can't barely lift. And I, even at the time, I was like, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll just work on my bench while my leg hurts. And I went in the gym, and I actually hurt my shoulder, too, because your body's just dealing yeah, with too many things at once. Yeah, your body's dealing with too many things. And then so I was like, well, if I can't be strong, I might as well start to work on, you know, getting in better shape. And I might as well start to try to regain uh, my health. And then that you know, sent me down a, a really, a really good path of um, kind of forging forward and start starting this as I call it a war on carbs. And I went on like a ketogenic style diet, which I used when I was younger. I've been familiar with ketogenic diets since I was um, about 18 years old or so. And so I went on this ketogenic diet and started to lose weight. And I think this is really important for people to understand is there's really no, like there's not a real rush to lose a lot of weight. Um, and I think that from what I've seen, uh, it makes the most sense to lose weight in stages. So let's just say, let's just say I lose like 20 pounds. Let's, let's just say, Mark, you need to sleep more, you need to hydrate more, you need to just cut out junk, and then I lose 20 pounds. Well, now the next thing uh, that you're going to ask me to do is probably going to be kind of hard so it might take me a little while to really put that into practice and to really get that going. And so I might be stuck at that weight loss for a few weeks. But who cares if I'm stuck? It's still 20 pounds less than I was before. So then you proceed for, fo- forward and you keep going and going and going. And I ended up losing about 100 pounds. And people are like, how long did 100 pounds take? And I always tell them it took 10 years. And then they're like, <laughs> they're like disappointed. But it, it didn't really take me 10 years. It took me, it took me like five or six years probably. But it took me like two or three years afterwards to understand and to know how to keep it off. Mm. That's the key is to keep it off. I mean, you can give people all kinds of ridiculous uh, uh, adjustments to their diet and have, you could have, just because you want to post it on YouTube, you could have uh, you know ten people lose a hundred pounds in ten days. I mean, it would actually be very simple. You just have them like you know water manipulate or, or do something slightly different than what they're doing, right? But that's not the goal. That's not the game. The, the game and the goal is to not just lose weight because every American, not every American, but most Americans have lost weight, and most Americans are successful at losing weight. What most Americans are not successful at is keeping the weight off, and so. When I fell with that 1,085, I wanted that to be a strong pivot point away from that to where I'm like, you know what? 
I might get kind of big again and stuff like that, but I'll never be, you know, 330 again. I'll never be 320 again. And I just kept knocking that bracket down mm -hmm. about 10 pounds, but I gave myself like a 10 pound swing because when you're that big, uh, just, you know, eating different food or, or not taking a poop for the day, it'd make you weigh uh, 10 pounds more. So when I weighed, you know, 300, I said goodbye to 330 forever. When I weighed, you know, 290, I said goodbye to 300 forever or whatever it was. But I try to make that agreement to myself to say, hey, you're not ever going to do that again. You're not ever going to go down that path again. Mm, man, 100 pounds. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. And so I, I love that idea of, you know, going in stages, you know, and, you um, I, you're basically changing that thermostat, that metabolic thermostat as you go along as well, giving yourself that leeway because I think a lot of folks, as they're losing weight, they get disappointed if they gain a pound or two, mm -hmm. you know, here or there. And understand even those things, like they fluctuate so much, man. But giving yourself like that 10 pound bracket of flexibility, right. that's such a good idea, man. Um, so there's so many things I want to ask you about. And so I'm just a big fan of your personality and, you know, I've been listening to your show and it's just so funny too, it was just some of these random things. And also just a story, like all the things that you've been through that you've accomplished and the willingness to share. But also I love the fact of like at your gym, if somebody's not sweating, because a lot of people want your attention now, you know, mm -hmm. like you're in this position. And so I wanna ask you, being in the position that you're in with so many eyeballs on you, like how does it, how does it feel? Like coming from where you came from, where you were just trying to, you know, make it in the in the business of like, you know, get into wrestling or whatever the case might be. That was that not your personality? And like, is this really where you're at right now? Is this really your your like your true calling and like where you're finding that fulfillment, happiness? Wrestling helped so much because I was so shy. Like I really didn't want to get up in front of people and talk. Um, I, I didn't want to, you know, like now I do seminars and different things like that. And that was just not part of my personality. I was always very, very like shy and just uh, didn't want to get up in front of people and talk, didn't really want to be like a leader. But one thing I realized as I was getting into the fitness space, it's like, well, if you want to be like recognized for this or do well at this, then you're going to have to figure out a way to communicate. And being an inventor uh, also made me realize, oh my God, like I created a product, but it really doesn't matter how good the product is because I need to communicate to people and tell them how good it is and, and I need to tell them why they need it. Like, why would you need this thing that you never even seen before? Mm. You know, it's not like a phone. Everybody needs a phone. It's uh, not a consumable product. It's not like a protein bar. It's not, like nothing like it has really ever existed before. So now I got the daunting task of like trying to figure out how the heck do I get people to understand what this thing is? How do I get people not to just laugh and think it's like a gimmick and things like that? And so. When I created the slingshot, I quickly recognized, or not even recognized, I was almost just like burdened with the fact that, yeah, you created a product, so you're in the game of like making products, and now you're automatically locked into the game of customer service, which I didn't know anything about. Now you're automatically locked into the game of having an e-commerce business, which I knew nothing about. You know, now you're you know, you're linked into this, uh, you know, being on a website, and and now you have to figure out like marketing. And now you have to have like a media team. These are all things I'm like, oh my God, I know nothing about them. But what I did know about was kind of like talking trash mm -hmm. from professional wrestling. And so a lot of the early videos and stuff was just me kind of like bragging about the product and throwing the product up over my shoulder like it was a championship belt <laughs> and saying, this is what you guys need to be able to bench press more weight and stuff like that. So it gave me a lot of courage to, uh, you know, kind of throw my hat in and, and be a voice in the community and I also ended up being a voice in the community uh, very early on because uh, I started my YouTube channel like right around the time YouTube started. Uh, Super Training 06, you know, the gym started in 2006. The YouTube ch channel followed shortly after that. I think YouTube started in 2006 and, um, you know, been, there's thousands and thousands of videos that, one thing I find really interesting, and this is really funny because you're asking about the eyes on me. so. It's, it's interesting to me because, ev like, and then you mentioned your brother earlier about having an advantage, like, you have an advantage over him or privilege over him, right? Um, everyone has an iPhone, and everybody has YouTube. Everybody has Facebook. Everybody has Instagram. 
And you've heard from so many people say, hey, Oprah has the same amount of hours in the day. Well, we, relatively speaking, in the United States here, we all have access to the same stuff. And I, I understand, yeah, people can have money and they can pay for people to do certain things. Uh, but um, you can go live on Instagram, whatever the phone costs. I mean, most people have a phone, right? And what, what I find super interesting is when I go somewhere, some older friends or some people that I've, not old friends, but friends I've had for a long time, when I get around them, they'll say, oh my God, you've blown up. I can't believe it. And I'm thinking, I didn't really blow up. I just drew attention to myself, <laughs> which, you know, 20 years ago, you would have been just an a-hole for that, right? <laughs> you wouldn't have been like glorified for it. So I always kind of find that kind of interesting. I'm like, I didn't really do anything. I just was filming stuff and just talking about stuff. The other thing too that I love to share with people is that, you know, I my story started with, you know, an injury, but I was at a Starbucks and I was on my uh, on my iPhone and I used Google and I looked up knee wrap manufacturers in the Google search. I just like to point some of these things out because this is all stuff that other people could, you know, anyone can do that. So whatever this idea is that's sitting around in your head, you 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 know you have a good idea, you know you have a good invention, you know you have a good product, but for some reason you just haven't pulled the trigger, lower that barrier of entry that you have into getting into whatever it is, I man, just look it up and just research it a little bit and poke around and see what you can find because all you need to do is find someone to make it for you. Once you have a prototype, then you can show people and say, hey, you see, you dummies, this is, this is <laughs> what I have. This is the product that I want I to make. Once you have that prototype, you can be off and running. Love it, man. Dude, thank you so much for <laughs> you. your dedication. Thank you for uh, sharing your story. Thank you for your openness. Thank you for um, being an inspiration for folks to get in the gym and to lift some heavy stuff. You know, there's a lot of men and women out there that, you know, are making not just better bodies, but like getting stronger. Like you even gave the anal uh, analogy earlier about like that mental strength as well that's required to just live today with so much coming at us because that social media you just mentioned can, mm -hmm. is a double-edged sword. Yeah. You know, we've got this access and availability to create and do just about anything. You've got the same tools everybody else does. And at the same time, you've got the tools everybody else does and you get to see what everybody else is doing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And um, you're putting out good vibes and like, I love the fact that your personality is so infused into the stuff that you do and just having a good time. Thank Even you. when you text me with the smelly bell, I was like, man, this, <laughs> I like this dude, man. And so just thank you, man. Thank you for, for being yourself. Appreciate man. it. Yeah, awesome. So can you let everybody know where, I, I mention where your gym is again mm -hmm. and where they can follow you and also mention your podcast. Super Training Gym, we're in uh, West Sacramento and it's uh, at the Super Training Gym on Instagram if you wanna hit us up and, and uh, just find out when we're there because if you just show up, it might be a little harder to figure out where it is and to get in and everything. Um, and then, yeah, the, uh, the website is uh, markbellslingshot.com. You want to buy knee wraps, knee sleeves, wrist wraps, uh, elbow sleeves, slingshots, whatever it is that you need to uh, get yourself through your training. I'm highly dedicated to just simply just trying to make this world a better place to lift, just make it a little easier for people to... I used to be of the belief uh, a few years back of like, hey, man, whatever form of exercise you want, that's cool. But now I'm of the belief, I think everybody needs some good resistance training. So that's my goal is to try to make, make it easier for people to lift, make it easier for people to understand lifting and what it can do for you. Get your butt in the gym, get some training done, and then I'm at Mark Smelly Bell on Instagram as well. Awesome. Thanks. Thank man. you. Thank Appreciate you for coming it. in. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show today. I hope you got a lot of value out of this. And I love what he said, make this world a better place to lift. Man, it's so cool, so powerful. And, you know, today it's really a great opportunity for us to really look at, like, what are our personal goals for our fitness and um, designing a protocol or a life structure to help us to get there and doing that within the parameters of your own ethics and your own, um, your own driving forces on what all of those pieces look like. And thank you so much for having compassion and understanding on Mark's story and also understand like he is somebody who's world class 
at what he does when we're talking about powerlifting and getting stronger and so much great advice is there for you if you want to take advantage of it you know make sure to follow him on um social media and also check him out check out his show he shares a lot of nuggets there and his videos man he's been on the internet dropping videos since they became a thing in the first place you know since youtube started so he's got a lot of stuff backlogged as well and uh also his brother has two films right can you share what those are yeah quick? my brother did uh bigger stronger faster yeah. and um it's sometimes on netflix and sometimes not but you can find it like on amazon or something like that and then um, he also did Prescription Thugs and another movie called Leaf of Faith. Check wow. those movies out. Awesome. Yeah. And so it's diving in more behind the scenes in these worlds of, you know, performance enhancing drugs and also into uh, pharmaceutical drugs as well, especially with Prescription Thugs and just looking at what's going on behind the scenes. We have another too. movie we're working on, too. What's this? Nutrition. Uh, yeah, yeah. We might need to talk to somebody who knows something about sleep. Okay, <laughs> done. So you guys will see me in a new movie coming up as well. And so again, thank you so much for tuning into the show today. And uh, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to share all these different perspectives and uh, different tools and insights for you to take advantage of. And we've got some powerhouse episodes coming your way. So make sure to stay tuned. All right, take care, have an amazing day, and I'll talk with you soon.